All right, what's going on everybody? Can you guys hear me okay? Thumbs up, clap, can I get a sign? Awesome, great. All right, uh, we, got a, we got a few more minutes till we kick off our next session. I wanna do a little bit of housekeeping. That video that you just saw was made by yours truly on my smartphone. We are two thirds of the way through our first annual Heroes Night in campaign, which is a safe distance curbside campaign to help promote local restaurants. And if you're in the 775 area, um, it's a $40 donation to my hometown heroes to receive your Heroes Night in passport to receive amazing deals from local restaurants, pubs, wineries, chocolate makers, and, uh, and breweries. Did I say that already? And there's a VIP passport where you get all those discounts and you also get a stainless steel wine tumbler that was made by our partner and fellow board members company, Granite Construction, Granite Supply and, and Sign Shop. <laughs> wow. Man. Okay. And uh, so yeah, stainless steel wine tumbler and also a bottle of Malbec or Chardonnay uh, from local Engineate Urban Winery. That VIP package is $100. And that also gets you admission to our Heroes Night Out event, which we have yet to publicly announce on September 16th, which is a Wednesday. And like I said earlier in the conference, the Heroes Night In event last year, we had $20,000 in scholarships the first night. So if you're a local, um, you know, feel free to definitely check that out. Just go to the myhometownheroes.org homepage. There is a banner rotator right when you land on there. And it uh, looks like we got a few minutes left here. Let's see. Um, yeah, we are, we're down to the wire with our last session. And uh, I'm really, really excited for our next uh, couple speakers and just a little bit of background. Um, per personal background is... I've known Jake Wiskirchen for uh, several years. We go all the way back to, to college days. We were both in student government back in the day. And um, let's see. So yeah, we, we, we reconnected at one of the Heroes Night in Passport stops, the Imbibe uh, Brewery. They make their own beers there. We caught up there and that's how that connection happened. And then we talked about the Survivor Summit and Jake was well, well all over. It gave us a good, good excuse to catch up. And then uh, Julie Larson is uh, someone I, connected with through uh, Matthew Zachary, who I talked about earlier in the summit during my keynote, and he was the founder of Stupid Cancer back in 2007. So that's how that connection happened, and we've had a, a call or two together, and um, I'm really excited that, uh, that they're on board. It's gonna make for a very powerful session on the power of the unspoken. And um, let's see, what else do we have? Any other? Oh, we are going to be, we are crafting a post-event survey as we speak. So um, that's in the works. We put this thing together, you know, in a very short amount of time. And so we want to get your feedback. If you at, um, attended two sessions, we want to get your feedback, especially if you are a scholarship candidate. Um, and if you've attended the two sessions, at least two sessions and fill out the survey, then you're going to be in the pool for a drawing to win uh, an extra $250 in scholarships for the spring semester. We're going to be awarding two of those. So make sure, uh, be on the lookout for that email. Um, if not by today, we'll, we'll have something prepared for you by tomorrow. And uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a great, um, this, it's, this day has gone really fast for us. Marsha, great job with keeping everything afloat with, um, with the Zoom and the audio and keep it, uh, keeping us on track. I uh, want to say thanks to all of our speakers today you guys were rocking it um just so much wisdom and, and gold in the content that you shared and definitely can't wait to share this with the world and uh, our, our final session coming up here the power of the unspoken i think is gonna it it blends in very nicely to i, I think from our our leadership previous leadership panel because you know when we go through something traumatic and you know we're trying to get out in the world, find, trying to find a job, or dealing with people in our environment. Uh, it's very, I think these are very important things to to acknowledge in terms of how we show up in life. And um, Julie and Jake are going to provide some great content, and some great interactions. So um, on that, do we have anything else to add? Or no, I'll we... just do the, the raffle and make those introductions. I, I don't see anybody join the call, so I think we can probably go. You want to turn yours down or should? Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up. I've been using Danny's speaker all day, so I apologize for that. Um, okay. So I'm here to do a couple things. One of them is give swag away. Danny wrote this book. I haven't read it all yet. So 
I can't even show the cliff notes. He's got these arm things. What are they called? Arm sleeves. Arm sleeves. And my favorite is this brandana. Danny and I went on a 21 mile trail run on Sunday. I would dip this whenever I saw a stream, put it on my head. It was awesome. So we're going to send this to somebody who's been on the call all day. It was a random drawing. A squared, Anthony and Tello, it's yours. So expect a care package in the mail. Thanks for being with us all day today. Hope you've uh, gotten as much out of this as I know I have. I think it's been a pretty cool experience for me. Um, being part of the planning team has been pretty awesome and Lord knows where this is gonna go from here because I think we created a great, great monster. So we end it, as Danny mentioned, he's already done the intros. Um, so I can either bypass my part or I can read what they put together. So I think I'll do that because I like airtime. It's about me for the moment. Uh, but this is a very special workshop and I think it's one where it's gonna foster a lot of interactivity. So if you have comments, put them in the chat. If you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, if, if you wanna share verbally, we'll even look at possibly doing that towards the end of the session, but it's an opportunity for all of us to grow. And if we want I share if our, our if our way of growing is to share verbally or through chat. Let's let's create that opportunity. But I'm going to start with ladies first. She also has an easier name. It's like Pete Parker. It's perfect. Julie Larson. Uh, Julie is a licensed clinical social worker who has spent her career working on call. Uh, excuse me, oncology supportive care. She has a vibrant private practice working primarily with individuals under the age of 40 years. That rules me out. Facing an unexpected medical diagnosis. Julia is a frequent speaker and educator to both survivor and professional audiences on the impact of serious illness at a young age. Living fully after a cancer diagnosis and resilience. Julia's clinical work has led her to be a trusted advisor to many advocate organizations. She has been featured in various publications, including Coping Magazine, Cure, Self Magazine, Crazy Sexy Cancer, survival guide, and many wellness and survivor blogs. So Julie, welcome. And before we get to you, introduce Jake. Jake Wiskirchen co-owns and operates Zephyr Wellness, which is a local outpatient counseling agency in Northern Nevada. He also hosts Noggin Notes, a mental health podcast, and serves in many other volunteer roles around the community, which include Walk to Talk America, which is a nonprofit suicide prevention organization that aims to bring together the communities of firearms and mental health. He's also the board chair for Pinecrest Academy of Northern Nevada, which is a local charter school and is a columnist for Reno Dads. Julie and Jake, welcome and take it away. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Pete. Yeah. Thank you all for having us here. And it sounds like this has been a big day. So we how honored we are to kind of wrap this up and, and let everybody share and have a voice in this last hour and a half. So um, I think I can speak for Jake and Jake, I'll let you speak too, that um, we certainly believe in the power of the mute button for the quality of the sound, right? That helps <laughs> keep it, but in no way let that silence you for the next hour. And if there is something that you want to talk about. And you, one of the things that Jake and I say really resonates for you or triggers something within you, we hope that you unmute yourself and, and speak up and interrupt and join in the conversation and or um, put a question or a comment in the chat room because we're really hoping that this is more of a dynamic conversation among all of us. And to that end, I'm just gonna go ahead and say that if you are willing to um, turn on your video, I sure would love to see your face. So um, I would love to have us be a full room here. So if you're willing to do that, welcome and join us. Yeah, I echo everything that Julie just said. Um, so I don't have to repeat it, that's it. I just echo everything she said. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I will add that um, we do absolutely thrive on participation. So as much fun as it may be for us to just sit up here and be professors, you know, spewing knowledge into the empty waiting vessels, which is the audience, uh, that's not enjoyable. Uh, so we have some prepared questions to uh, warm this up a little bit, kick it off. And from there, uh, as Julie mentioned, if something particularly uh, piques your interest or intrigues you, uh, ask it. 
and uh, nothing's really off the table at this point. I, I think I think we're we're both pretty competent in handling um, all sorts of things, and uh, even if you want to get personal, uh, we can do that too and um, make it as comfortable as possible for everybody. Okay. So Jake, how should we begin? I think that when we when this was presented to us, the understanding was. Um, that as young adult, adolescent and young adult survivors, you are walking through life with um, a lot to, to do, right? A lot, a lot on your plate, a lot to accomplish, a lot you wanna focus on. And at the same time, there's all this emotion and sometimes the mental game that kind of gets in our way from time to time. And so that's kind of what we were here to kind of just talk about is how do we navigate this path? How do we move forward? So Jake, how would you begin? Uh, thanks. It's almost like we uh, chatted about this two days ago, and uh, that was a great layup for me. Uh, my bailiwick when I do counseling is based on emotional functioning. I, I pull from a variety of different what we would call therapeutic modalities in our field. Um, I try to integrate as much as possible, but what really supports the the entire philosophy is our emotional functioning. And I'm not going to do the full blown lesson here. You can hear that either on the Zephyr Wellness YouTube channel and just look up emotional functioning, um, or uh, on the podcast. Uh, and I can put that in the chat later. But the idea is that our brain our brain does lots of stuff, but essentially that what we're concerned with in counseling and psychotherapy when people are going through tough times is thinking which is in the frontal lobe and feeling which is in the like back here the middle to rear section of your brain so i turn away from my microphone that make terrible audio so i'll turn this way but it's in the middle to rear back path of your uh, part of your brain and they don't operate simultaneously when you're thinking when you're in logic reason uh what we would call executive functioning feeling or emotion is you know drastically diminished so it's not that it turns off altogether, but, but it's down. S similarly, the opposite happens. If you're in a high emotional state, thinking, cognition, rational analysis diminishes. So the example I always use is when you're you know, in a big knockdown, drag out, screamo argument, uh, rarely does reason apply. And it's simply because the wrong part of your brain is working. So if, if, you, can, if you can get through the emotion uh, you can apply a little bit more logic and then you can move forward uh, uh, well in life. So we want to identify the emotions. We want to name them. We want to claim them. And we want to apply them to what we're experiencing in life because they all have what's called an adaptive function, meaning they teach us how to adapt to what the environment is telling us. So um, if, uh, if a mountain lion jumps out in front of you, you should have a, a fear response to that. And then that fear response is telling you to, you know, to do something. So uh, similarly with all our other emotions, we want to know what they're telling us and then reasonably logically work through them to a conclusion. I want to, I always try to teach that as, as the, the foundation for when we move forward so that when, when questions come up or people are struggling with stuff, I can, I can reach back and point to that and say, Hey, what are you feeling? And what, what do you think it's telling you to do? Um, and that helps us bring a little bit more clarity and control to our responses to life. Uh, so, so it goes with, uh, with illness, with, um, distress of all kinds, um, trauma, trials and tribulations, and even, even happy events. Uh, we want to know what the emotion is telling us so that we can embrace life fully, tolerate the curve of emotion, and then move on. We don't want to, we don't want to live in it or be stuck in it. We definitely don't want to react out of it because that's when we, uh, we often do impulsive things we really regret. Jake, I'm going to bounce off of you a little bit. Did I just hear you say we want to understand it and, 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 and gather information from that feeling? Because, you know, I'm sitting here as a therapist and I know you are too. And I'm just going to kind of open this up for everybody else to just kind of take a peek into what this is like. Um, I feel in my practice, I love the way you said there's thinking and feeling. There's thinking, feeling, and there's also your body. I'm going to add that right. body there. Physiology. Our body yep. is big, right? Mm -hmm. And thinking, feeling, body. And one of the things I challenge when I speak and when I am sitting with my, with my clients is how do you know? Can you step back for a second and just kind of take a moment and think, do you know how stress shows up for you? Like when we say that word stress and it's very, it's very vague, right? Like I'm stressed, I'm totally stressed out, or I'm like really um, uh, upset, distressed. How does that show up? What does that look like? And I think that that might be the step one or the foundation of self-awareness. And I've noticed, and Jake, I don't know about you, but as I've been in my practice longer, 
I guess I, I see that there are those clients who sit with me who tend to notice their thinking first. They're, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think. And everything that they say to me on the couch, or, you know, that makes it sound like I'm Freud with a couch. But, like, there is a couch here. But, um, but everything they say to me is, I think this. You know, if my sister just would do this, I think that. If my doctor would tell me this, I think that. If this would just happen, I think I would, I think. And it's all this narrative in their head. And when I say, as a therapist, well, how does that make you feel? Yeah. <laughs> That's what we do. Right. How does that make you feel? It's very hard for them to name that feeling. They're thinkers, right? And yet they are having feelings. And so my work there is to figure out when, you're, when, that, when that waterfall of thoughts is happening, how can you begin to recognize and name Name it and claim it. You said that the feeling that's happening for you. Then, then alternatively, I have other people who are in my office who are feeling all the emotion, right? There's tears, there's sadness, they're confused, they're lost, they're, they're irritable, they're, they're, they're scared, they're uncertain. And when I say to them, tell me a little bit more about what's behind that feeling for you or what, what are you thinking about? that's really hard for them to grab. In fact, I just had a client today and I was saying, she was telling, talking to me about feeling sad. And I said, well, when you're feeling sad, um, what are you thinking about? And she's like, I don't know. And I said, well, can I have you watch that? Can I have you just kind of fly on the wall, pay attention to what's happening in your head? And then third, I've got people that I sit in my couch and they're in a ball and their stomach is in knots and they're headache, they're headachy and they're fatigued and all of their stress is showing up in their body. So. I think my first piece of homework for my audience today or for all of you is to just really, how does stress show up for you? Are you a thinker? Are you a feeler? Are you body? And recognizing that we're all of it actually. So how do we begin to really understand the interplay of all of that and where it's kind of hanging us up? Yeah, I think it's, I'm putting, I'm putting links here in the, in the chat box. And actually I, I skipped the first one. The first one is actually the overview, which is right there. Um, we don't teach this in any curriculum, unfortunately. We, we're getting better at it as an educated, you know, an educated society. We're moving towards social and emotional learning for our kids. Um, but we as the adults who are supposed to be teaching this stuff, we never learned it. It's, it's not in our health class. It should be, uh, but it's, it's not. And so we kind of fumble forward. And then uh, one of my favorite exercises to ask the audience whenever I teach this, and I can ask this right now and I'll give some, some space for people to type it in. How many emotions do you think you have? Mm, I love this. Oh, I've seen the research on this too. Put it in there. Put it in the chat box. How many emotions do you think you have? How Are the words do you use, right? Yeah. How many, how many emotions do you think human beings have? Millions, Catherine says. Wait for a few more guesses. No penalty for guessing. This is, no this is like the SAT. Be honest. Yeah. 10, like that. 10, tons. tons. 32. 1856.72. The 72 <laughs> one hundredths of an emotion. Hundreds. Five. Five. 10. Yeah. And I mean, thinking about like when somebody says, how are you today? What do you have available to you to say? So we've got guesses all over the map from uh, single digits to uh, good <laughs> um, single digits <laughs> to the millions. Um, the, the research that I draw from is from this book. Uh, it's co called the psychology of emotions by a guy named Carol Izzard. And uh, he literally wrote the book on the psychology of emotions. You can see it's right here. And it, <laughs> it looks intimidating and it looks like a textbook and it sort of is, but it's actually a really easy read. If you can find this um, and you're super interested in this, you want to nerd out, pick it up. But what Izzard found in his research, and he studied this for about 50 years and he taught at the university of Delaware for some 30 odd years. Uh, does it come in digital uh, cliffs notes? Yes, actually it's called a podcast and it's mine. You can listen to the podcast. That's the cliff notes version of psychology of emotion. But um, what he found is that there are 10. Uh, and the reason that there are 10 is because uh, through his research, he discovered that in the brain, these 10 emotions, which are um, anger, fear, sadness, contempt, guilt, shame, excitement, joy, or happiness, and surprise, uh, and, and interest, interest and excitement. I said excitement, sorry. Um, they, they, what they do is they do discrete, meaning uh, unique, not like C-R-E-E-T, which is like, sh like be discrete, but like C-R-E-T-E, -E, uh, unique one to the next. They do a discrete function and they tell us what's going on in the environment. So they literally teach us how to respond. And now so goes the anthropological theory that the reason that 
uh, Homo sapiens, our people, uh, evolved and not some of the other hominids like Australopithecus and uh, Neanderthal and so forth, is because we had bigger limbic systems. The limbic system is responsible for the emotion. And the emotional functioning is what connects us as human beings. Because what, uh, what else is found is that um, within about 87 to 94% accuracy, um, we know what someone is feeling based on their facial expression on those 10 emotions. So this is really important. It draws us together in community. What are communities good for? Well, surviving things like predator attacks and the elements and climate change. Some of the other hominids that did not evolve and survive, they had bigger prefrontal cortices or uh, frontal lobes. So it means they were smarter, they could develop tools and so forth, but they didn't hang together. And when the climate changed or predators attacked, they got wiped out. Uh, so goes this anthropological theory. So we need our emotions. We need to understand our emotions to connect as human beings and, and hang together, uh, you know, in tribes, so to speak. So it's really important to understand this stuff. And that's why I've, I, you know, pin most of what I do in, in my career on emotional functioning, uh, because we have to know what we're feeling in order to articulate it, get somebody else to respond, push through it, and then live life uh, and, and respond to our environments. And I think the more that you know the I think there's such wisdom and you talked about teaching our children and I wanted to say there's never, it's never too late to be learning and thinking about this. We have to expand our feeling vocabulary because imagine if you went into the ER and you had a cut on your shoulder or something wrong with your shoulder and you had no words and you were just in pain and you were screaming and yelling, but the doctors were trying to understand how to treat you, but you weren't using words. It would be very hard to know how to care your shoulder like what's happening there and if you're not speaking and not sharing so we need our language to be as specific as possible because you're going to do something very different think about this you're going to do something very different with sadness and loss than you're going to do with irritability and disgust right so with the more the more fine-tuned you can get at naming and understanding what you're feeling i tell my clients all the time I often give them the homework. I give them a lot of homework, <laughs> but I often give my clients the homework of, I want you to just name, just go through this next week before I see you again and just notice what you're feeling. Just notice it for me. Just, just name it and claim it. So, because we can kind of just like be floating through our life. And at the point that you begin to name a question and our name a feeling, you create just a little bit of space between yourself and that feeling and giving you a little time there to respond and not react. So I will leave, I will plant that seed for all of you too, is to begin as you kind of function through life, just to name, what am I feeling? What's going on? Taking, getting in the habit of taking, taking it, taking your temperature, checking in with yourself. Yeah. I've been doing this long enough to know that uh, there's probably people out there rolling around in their heads going, Hey, well, I don't get it. Like I, I know I feel way more than 10 and something else that is or discussed. And, and is is just one person who studies this stuff. There's lots of people who study this stuff. And um, some of them have said there's seven emotions. Some say that there's more or less, but essentially what Izzard's work uh, produced was the idea that anything that's not on that list, and those are all on a continuum too, and we have different words for, you know, things like sadness. You can have disappointment. That's a little tiny bit of sadness, all the way up to anguish, which is extreme sadness. Um, so we have different words and synonyms for those things. But if you look on there, you, you see what's missing, things like that we commonly refer to as emotions, like I feel overwhelmed. Um, I feel anxiety. I feel depressed. Uh, uh, jealousy is not on there. Love is not on there. And the reason for this is that they're either hybrids of emotion or hybrids of emotion and thought. So if you have a hybrid of emotion and thought, um, your experience will be different because thoughts are something we can control and they, and they vary based on the environment. So if you say I, I'm overwhelmed, my overwhelmed, it might be a combination of fear that I can't tackle whatever task is overwhelming me. Um, it could be uh, an initial shame that I'm not going to be able to perform it. Um, it could be disappointment, you know, that, that I didn't do it mixed with the interpretation of what it is that's overwhelming me and why it's overwhelming me. It's going to be different than Julie's experience than Danny's experience and Pete's experience. So we don't want to use uh, generic uh, blanket terms like anxiety and, and distress and so forth, because it doesn't create the precise connection that we need in order to get validated of those 10, everybody can identify with those 10. They're not, they're not imprecise. 
Um, so when we get into like the clinical realm, we say, Hey, what's, what's bothering you? Say, I, I just feel frustrated. Like, well, what is frustrated? Some people put it on the anger continuum. Some people put it on the sadness continuum, uh, literal definition. And this is why words matter. Literal definition of frustrated is to be blocked. Um, you know, or thwarted if you will. Uh, so if I'm driving down the road, uh, my path is frustrated by, uh, a do not enter sign and I have to take a detour. Um, what I'm getting is actually an experience of sadness because I had an expectation that was not being met. My expectation is I'm going to go straight down the road and I'd have to make a bunch of turns. So if I don't know how to tolerate and label accurately that disappointment, it makes the rest of my day harder because I can't actually neurologically validate what's going on in my head by saying, oh, this is disappointing and I'll be okay because I've been here before, I know what disappointment is like. Um, I just need to navigate this, this detour and I'll be fine. If I just go, I was frustrated, I was frustrated. It, it doesn't quite accurately do the job. And then we get through the detour, we get to our place of you know destination, wherever, and we just sit there and go, oh, I'm so frustrated, that traffic. It's because I didn't validate accurately what it was I was feeling. So that's why, that's why this is super important. That's why some of those, those words you might think of as feelings are, are missing. Um, so uh, you said the word tolerate, and I just kind of want to bounce over here to one of the questions that we have and in a way to kind of see if any of this resonates for you. And I'm hoping that it does. And if there are things that you want us to focus on that where we're not going, I really would love for you to hear that. So I'm going to ask this question. It's out there and we can kind of take turns. You just said the word tolerate, which makes me think of this. Um, I feel stress a lot. The news can be paralyzing to read some days. When I think about job opportunities, it seems pretty hopeless. And I just need to get better at grounding myself so I don't spiral. But I have no idea what that means. I don't want to feel like this. I want concrete things I can do to feel more control. So what can we, what can we say to that? Or, you know, I, I, I certainly have some ideas. I don't know if you want, you want to say like, when you're feeling that sense, I don't know if that resonates or that, that question like kind of hits home for any of you, but um, it, that makes a lot of sense, right? We are at a time, and certainly with COVID-19 and lockdown, where the world has not been normal for five plus months, for five months. And on top of that, um, I don't know where all of you are in your cancer journey, but if you are in treatment or if you are post-treatment, that changes you. I mean, we can, we 100% a cancer diagnosis changes you. And it takes time to understand how. And so depending on how far out you are, you're probably in the journey of figuring out, hey, what am I grieving and what is not the same for me at all? And what am I missing? And what am I feeling it's not fair and, and really mourning? And what am I working hard to understand about where I stand today and where I want to go? And in the midst of that, I've got scans, I've got side effects that I might still feel, I've got twinges that trigger fear and worry and uncertainty. And how do I just function through the day to day to day? So, um, I, I, I don't know if you want to start with grounding, I can, and then I can pick it up and go with you too, but I think that it's really important to know some just basics of what do you do when your head gets spinny, or what do you do when you feel the intensity of an emotion that kind of hijacks your day, perhaps unexpectedly or totally expectedly if you're leading up to a scan. What is it that you have available to you to kind of stay in the game, tolerate, and move forward calmly. I think our uh, our approaches to grounding are going to be a little bit different. I'm going to you know break it down by emotional functioning, and so you know maybe maybe uh, maybe I'll have you go first with some of the traditional uh, grounding techniques, yeah. and then I'll go with the more logical um, dismantling chain analysis approach. If that works. I'm happy to go first. <laughs> so when I think of grounding, and I think this is like a pillar of self-care, is that again, I'm gonna go back to mind-body. I'm gonna go back to thinking and feeling. And I'm gonna connect that feeling not only to emotion, but to your physicality. And grounding to me very literally means getting in your present. And if you think about it, anxiety, uncertainty, fear, worry, all of those feelings, typically our head is bouncing way forward into a perceived future, right? We're planning, we're, we're worrying, we're concerned, 
we're uncertain about some, some, where something's going to go. We're living in our future. Now, sometimes when we're feeling sadness and grief and regret, shame, all of those things, we can be kind of living way back here in the past, kind of second guessing. What did I do that caused this? Maybe I should have done this more. I, I, if I ought, to, I ought to have done this, or what if I hadn't done this? You know, that's, that's past. And in doing both of those things, you are squeezing out the present. So your entire head is either flashing forward or dwelling in the past, and we are losing your present. And I say to survivors all the time, and I so hope that you hear this to me, from, from me today, cancer has taken way too much from you. Do not let it take your present. So when you feel that spin and when you feel that worry and that fear and that uncertainty, I don't know where I'm going to go. I want you to use that as a anchor to, okay, there it is. I feel it. I recognize it. And that's my reminder to get back in my present, to get back in my right now. How do you do that? So what are the techniques? What are those concrete tools you're asking for? I tell people all the time, use your five senses. Your body lives only in the present. Your head lives all over the place, but your body lives in the present. So get connected to your body and you've got five senses to help you. You've got your hearing. So listen, what do you like? Can you name things that you hear in this right now? Can, what do you see? Take inventory. What are you looking at? Can you, what do you smell? What do you feel? Meaning the temperature of the, of the air, um, your feet on the ground, on the ground. I was working with a guy once, um, who had a lot of anxiety and concern. And, and he often would meet that anxiety when he was at work. And I said, listen, his name was Jake. Listen, Jake, when you feel that, I want you to just sit. I want you to put your hands on your thighs. And I want you to put your hands on your thighs, squeeze your thighs. I want you to rock your feet between your toes and your heels. And he looked at me like I was a little crazy. And I said, nobody's gonna need to know. You don't need to write a poster about this. You don't need to announce that you're doing it, but I want you to get in your body and feel your present. And he came back to me and he said, you know, I did that and it really did help me get out of my spin. So use your five senses to get yourself grounded in your present and, and see if that can help you. Breathing and breath, that's traditional. That's very, you hear people talk about your breath all the time, but where do you feel your breath? Um, so really think about that. I feel my breath in different times at different, at different, based on how I'm feeling. If I'm feeling really irritable and anxious, I tend to feel my breath in my like gut, like I feel the rise and the fall of my diaphragm. If I'm feeling sad and heavy, I tend to feel my breath in my exhale at my nostrils. So I want you to kind of just pay close attention to where am I feeling that breath and really focus. When we think, one more thing, I'll say one more thing and then I will turn this over and let you take this and have Jake add more to that. When we think of grounding ourselves in our present, tuning into your senses and getting kind of in your here and your now, you want to think of your attention. I use the metaphor of a flashlight. So if the flashlight of your attention is shining on the what if, what if, what if, right? What if my scan comes back and it shows recurrence? What if it shows progression? What if I can't get a job? What if I have to live in my parents' basement for the rest of the, my days? <laughs> what if I can't pay for this? What if I can't do rent? What if I can't, what if, what if, what if? If your flashlight of your attention is all on that story, I want you to do, really think about turning that flashlight to your body. I want you to feel about, feel the, the, the floor on your feet? Can you feel the seat that you're sitting in? Can you feel you have the energy in your hands? So just turning that flashlight of your attention somewhere else so that it gives your brain a bit of a break or balances it. Hopefully that helps or hopefully that gives you something to hold on to. I want to pause for a second and get feedback from people. What's this doing for you? Feel free yeah, to unmute yourself. I, yeah, Danny. If I may say so myself, get the echo out of here. <laughs> All right. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I just want to f start out with the, the 10 different emotions, Jake, that you listed here from, from, that, from the psychology of emotions. I think when we're going through cancer and through all the different drugs and um, sleepless nights and uh, the steroids, like I think is, you know, going through that ringer as a, as a patient, we experience all those things at very various degrees. Um, you know, speaking from personal experience, having a racquetball removed from my head, having massive seizure complications, and then being put on extremely high doses of steroids for an entire year. Like it was a, it was a, I mean, I was in the deepest levels of sadness. I was in the highest levels of bliss through that entire year. It was just a, just a crazy, crazy roller coaster. And, you know, when we, 
when we're going, you know, we all have various time periods where we're going through treatment, but um, when we get into that, we're, we're adjusting to a new, a new normal. You know, we're adjusting to a, a new way of life and living. And when we can learn to a, adapt to that new normal, then we can start, we have a little more control over our schedule because, you know, we have a regimented, um, you know, we, daily or, or weekly agendas. You got to take shots, you know, in your stomach or, you know, your thigh, um, you know, six hour doses of medications and everything. But then that just becomes part of your routine. And once you can, once you start building, you can build resilience around there um, through, because you'll find, you'll begin to find pockets of time where your mind might idle and, you know, figuring out what you can do that is, puts you in a more meditative state, um, such as maybe reading a book or going for a walk or a jog. And to your guys' point about uh, centering yourself, um, through treatment and even even after treatment you know for for me my my drug of choice in remission was endurance sports like i couldn't i couldn't get enough of it because every time i finished with a with a long bike ride or i got done with a five mile run i would feel centered because i i'm re you know i'm recoagulating my my, my mind and body into one and, and taking myself out of um thoughts and scenarios that are only in my head, but they're, but they're not real. And that's, those, those are the things that, that cause us anxiety. And I just want to share a quick story that I, I, I think I shared with you, Jake, on the podcast. But um, when I finished chemotherapy, you know, I was supposed to go to Europe with my best friends for two and a half months. And then I was like, well, this would be a great happy ending to my story that if I went full circle and I ended up doing that trip to Europe, that would be great. But then, you know, we entered a recession and this, the thing that I aspired that, I aspired to the most back then was the thing that was causing me the most anxiety. I have to go to Europe. I have to go to Europe. I have to go to Europe. So I asked myself a different question. What would my life look like if I let go of Europe and I focused on, on healing because I still had seizure complications. I had all kinds of issues. And when I came to that moment of realizing that thought, that level of, of self-awareness, that that aspiration to go to Europe was no longer serving me. And I let that go. I began to see the world. I began to see opportunities that I couldn't see before because I was attached to this certain outcome. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, we go through so much through, through cancer treatment. Um, we, we tend to build defense mechanisms through that, through that process as well. We, we tend to guard our vulnerability, um, you know, because we're fighting for our lives and, you know, there, there's good reason to, to guard our vulnerability. But I think, you know, that that's, that's our, greatest opportunity for growth is to be vulnerable. And, you know, when our emotions are flying all over the place, um, we need to kind of sit back and acknowledge what we're feeling from like a third party perspective um, and not within ourselves and ask ourselves, be, have, that, have that consciousness to where we can actually choose how we react or respond to what we're feeling to, to what we're, right. what we're feeling. And, um, when you can bring in that self-awareness, I mean, that, that is, that is absolute like power to where you can recognize what your thoughts are saying and you can, you know, you can name it, you can name, you know, whatever emotion that is that keeps bothering you, you know, like, I don't know, Iggy or something, just take, you know, you name that emotion, you take away its power, then you can, um, say, shut up Iggy, you know? <laughs> um, so you, you define an avatar to it as well. So it's not, I'm yeah. just going to pick that's, up on also something. My perspective on that. Go ahead, Jake. Yeah. No, uh, that, that's fine. Go ahead. I was just going to pick up on something you said too that um, we have the ability to respond. We have ability to kind of make some choice there. Some, you know, that I worry sometimes in our culture that we bucket feelings into good feelings, like oh, happy, joy, contentment, success. You know, all that's a consistent feeling. But like these is good, and to feel anxious, to feel fear, to feel um, all these things, anger. That that's bad, right? And feelings are feelings. Feelings are feelings, and they're all normal, and they're all understandable. My God, think of what you've all been through. It would be surprising to me if you weren't feeling some degree of sadness or worry or fear, right? So I think our feelings teach us. 
And if we keep trying to push out the bad ones and distract and move over, then we miss out on working to understand what it's teaching us or what it's how, how it's helping us to grow. I'm seeing so many wonderful comments over here in the chat box. I want to comment on some of them, but Jake, I'll let you go. go yeah. Um, so I want to get back to something that Julie said earlier that made me want to jump out of my skin because uh, I haven't heard anybody else uh, talk like this except for my good friend and mentor, Christian Conti, whose YouTube channel I put in the in the chat box there. Uh, fa fantastic material there. And it's the idea of that anxiety is when we're mentally dwelling in the future and depression is when we're mentally dwelling in the past. Um, and so when we're doing that, we're missing the present, which actually in a very paradoxical and unfortunate way gives us more reason to be anxious and depressed because we, we now realize that we spent so much time mentally focusing elsewhere that we missed life. So we want to, we want to not do that. And so to, to talk about the, um, the anxiety issue from earlier, I view anxiety and this is how I ground myself and this is how I teach people to ground themselves. Um, we go back to the emotion. What's the emotion underlying the, this uh, generic term we call anxiety? Well, t chiefly it's fear. Uh, fear of what? Um, the future. The future is unknown. And in Western society, America specifically, we are driven by a lot of certainty and certainty begets a need for knowing things. And so we're not great at embracing mystery. The future is full of mystery because it's not here yet. And so when we, when we, think about the future too much and we, we fixate our thoughts on it, then what we end up doing is we try to, we, we falsely believe that we can, we can uh, address something that's not here yet. And that gives us a sense of fear. Cause it's like, Oh no, what if, what if, what if, what if, like Julie was saying. Um, and that gives us a sense of anxiety. So let's peel it back. What's the fear? Well, fear as a lesson from, from Izzard's uh, research is uh, it teaches us that there's a threat or a danger present. Now, what threat or danger might be present? Well, if we look at what's making us anxious, maybe we can point to it and say, if this thing happens, then something bad will befall me. Okay. And we want to mindfully prepare for those things. We want to save for retirement. We want to anticipate uh, bills at the end of the month and uh, you know things like that. What we don't want to do is live there, right? So how do we do that? Well, we go back to thinking about it. We can write this stuff down. We, uh, I, I'm a big fan of making lists of what's going on in someone's head. If you can't sleep at night, uh, writing everything down that's rolling through your head can help because you set it on the nightstand and you go, it'll be there in the morning. Not right now. Right now is sleep time. I'll deal with this in the morning. Sometimes rank ordering the priorities helps. Uh, you can only have one number one priority at once. So you don't get multiple. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, and that helps to shake things out. Well, what really matters? Well, what really, really matters? And then we can rank order these. Um, and that helps us get some actual control over what's making us anxious. Now, as far as uh, um, Catherine's question about, is it common to think you're in the present, but you're not? Um, believing in fake realities, if they're a fact. Um, sometimes, sometimes. And I don't, I don't want to uh, scare anybody with what I'm about to say. When you... When you imagine an alternate reality and then believe in it, we would call that some sort of psychosis. Uh, it's a departure from reality. It's, it's a delusional thinking. It's, um, it's, it may be a hallucination of some sort. But that's, in my view, the way that I look at symptoms, that's just another symptom. It's no better or worse than any other symptom. Depression is a symptom of something. Anxiety is a symptom of something. Drinking too much alcohol is a symptom of something thinking that you're in a reality that doesn't exist is just a symptom of something. It's neither good nor bad. So um, yes, that, that happens all the time. Um, to what degree does it play out in your life? Well, that can, you know, that can have an effect uh, on your life, but you know, without specific examples, it would be really hard to address that. But I just want to validate that and say, yeah, that's not unusual. Um, if you, the, the point is though, that you notice it, if you don't notice it, we got problems because <laughs> then you, you fumble around thinking that you're Jesus or that Trump is talking to you in your bedroom or whatever. Um, and that would be problematic if you weren't aware that that was unusual behavior, but you're aware of it. When you're aware of it, you can start taking steps to get control of it. Um, um, Catherine, go ahead. Catherine would, would you be willing to share a little bit more? Would you be open to unmuting and telling us a little bit more about what that means for you? Maybe not, <laughs> but I just thought I would invite you to kind of, because others in the group might feel the same way. And I wonder if your words might kind of be something that other people feel just as much as you do. If not, that's okay. And feel free to shout at us too, if we're not- yeah, uh, Interrupt if that, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so, go ahead, so um, 
Jen points out, she says, uh, I find when I'm scared and anxious, focusing on how it can be helpful of service or of service to someone else helps uh, call me and bring me back to my center. Absolutely. Being other centered is very critical to recovery of anything really, because it takes you out of your own mind. Um, depression works the same way. You're not so focused on what you don't have, what you missed out on, how life's disappointing mm -hmm. you if you're focusing on serving others. So that's a great tactic. I, I, I love that technique. And then, um, Katie's asking about uh, struggling with missing important events, uh, dealing with, you know, all the disappointment that comes with that. Um, another great technique that we have in our profession is called a reframe. So if you think about a picture that doesn't look so good because it's in a crappy frame, you can take that picture out, put it in a better frame, and now it looks great. Um, we, similarly, we can reframe events in our lives. So um, I don't want to make this sound trite or glib. Um, missing high school graduation is significant. I, uh, I have a kindergartner who's going to start school for the first time this fall, and it's, it's back and forth. We are going to open in a hybrid model. There will be a physical first day of school. But for a while there, about a week here in Northern Nevada, there was a, a threat of um, all online school. Uh, like they're doing in Southern Nevada. And that will break parents' hearts if they don't get the traditional first day picture. Similarly with, with seniors not getting to graduate. However, I offer you this reframe. Never again in probably our lifetimes will there ever be such an event. So you get a story to tell that nobody else gets. And that's a reframe away from the disappointment. And instead you get to choose your response to the situation say, you know what? I get to tell this story forever. I was in that class of 2020 or 2021 or whatever it is that didn't get a graduation. We had all these drive-by car honking signs in our yards. It was, man, that was really cool. And then everybody after that gets to go, you know what? That was kind of special. I just get to walk across the stage at Lawler Events Center. <laughs> like, so it's, it actually provides a really cool, unique story to tell later on. And, um, and it makes the experience very, very cool if, if you let it. And, and I like highlighting the idea of choice there. Again, once you're aware that you have a choice and you're not just response to environment, you know, reflexively acting uh, on these things, then you can author your own story. And um, you can apply this anywhere, a vacation, if your luggage gets lost, your flight gets delayed, or uh, driving, driving around, you get a detour. Um, you get to tell a story when you, when you show up. Another thing I would add to that, and I totally agree, what a story we have in all of this, and what unprecedented times we are living in. And um, hopefully we all get to the other side of that mountain, this, this mountain, and can look back and be like, woo, 220, 2020, that was intense, <laughs> right? But, and hopefully you're also going to do that with your cancer experience, right? I would also say as part of, you know, my work in my office, I'm, I'm helping people to begin to not only recognize their feelings, not only get closer, get better at understanding what's the thinking going on there. But um, a lot of times, a lot of times underneath an uncomfortable feeling, I'm going to call it uncomfortable, underneath an uncomfortable feeling is also a driving and persistent unmet need what are you supposed to so say? when you're thinking about i didn't get to do graduation and that's feeling really hard for me or i didn't i'm not i'm missing out on connecting with my friends and saying goodbye as people leave for college or not leave for college or you know are i i don't know what i'm going to be doing what what are you needing in that can you really like take a moment and stop and think are we needing connection? Who? are you needing tradition are you needing um, validation and affirmation from somebody? What, what are you needing in that? Then can we, if, if you name that, you know what I'm needing is I'm needing just acknowledgement that I did this thing in high school and I'm needing acknowledgement that I was top of my class day gone it and I was in the honor roll and I, I got this award and nobody, everybody else gets to stand on a stage and get acknowledged by everybody and I don't and I need that. So if you can think about that feeling that you're having, what maybe unmet need is in there? Maybe it's connection. Everybody else got a party around a punch bowl and I didn't get that you know so how do you find that and can we meet those needs in some other ways and 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 so that's one thing the other thing I've been saying to people about pandemic life and this is in general but I've been saying it a lot more as I've been working with people through this and and right now I think everyone is living in a lockdown fatigue state right like this is monotonous and dull and boring and hard to continue to tolerate but can you also bucket your thoughts? And what I mean by that is, okay, that, that thought is a past thought, that thought is a present thought, that lot, 
thought is a future thought. Like, what are we going to do? That's a future thought. That's a future thought. Just bucket it, bucket it, bucket it. And in some ways, can you tell yourself, can you believe in yourself enough? Can you trust yourself enough to say, I'm going to leave that to my September self. I'm going to leave that to my future self. Today is August 5th, Wednesday. That is not what I'm dealing to deal with today. I hear you thought, I get it, that I got to figure out what I'm going to do in the fall. And I'm going to leave that to my fall self. So there is some wisdom to the way that as a human, we are sophisticated and we plan and we prepare. But I think we can also get super spinny in that too. And sometimes we can trust in the efficacy of our future self. Um, I want to, I, I love that. I love the, the, the idea of delaying that and having faith in one's own self to overcome it. Um, you, you're, uh, you're brushing up against a, a concept that I like to teach the difference between self-esteem and self-efficacy. Self-esteem is how we feel and self-efficacy are the, the permanent things that often generate how we feel. So um, if I have good high self-esteem, it can come from something permanent, like a good performance or a job well done or acquisition of knowledge or, you know, something like that, that would be my self-efficacy. Similarly, I can have bad self-efficacy too. If I've made mistakes and I, I keep focusing on them, that'll give me bad self-esteem. But more often than not, our self-esteem arises from things like a fancy company shirt or a sweet hairdo or a crappy beard that I can't grow. Um, and those things are temporary and fleeting. Um, my shirt will eventually get holes in it and I'll throw it away. My, my car will die my you know my home might collapse or something i don't want to anchor my identity and certainly not my belief in self on things that are temporary so if you have good self-efficacy you have a reason to believe that the future self will deal with problems in an adequate and comprehensive and competent way so that you don't need to worry about it right now you can delay what yes. julie's talking about i want to take a swing at a couple of these in the in the question box here and do my best to try to wrap them all into one um the idea that Sarah mentioned about um, being taboo or the stigma of asking somebody who's having a good mental health day, part of what I really want to accomplish at the end of my career, whenever that may be, is, the, is to normalize the conversation in such a way that we don't have a hiccup about it. Um, we can ask, hey, how's your anxiety doing? I know you've been struggling lately with worry. The same calm, nonchalant way that we ask, hey, how'd that ACL repair go? I know that you were, you know, you, you had your knee worked on. Like we should be able to have that. I would, I would like for people to be posting selfies on Instagram of, you know, be waiting in the lobby of Zephyr Wellness, you know, like I'm getting my anxiety treatment on, you know, and I would love that. Uh, it normalizes everything so that we can walk together, supporting each other in peace. Um, so my invitation to y'all who are listening, if you want to fight that battle, uh, you be normal about it and then demonstrate to others how normal it is for you. And then that'll be an invitation to others to go, Oh, well, that wasn't weird. I talked to Sarah and she, she wasn't weird about it. So I guess I don't have to be weird either. And then the, you just, you'll be amazed at the ripple effect that that, that causes. Um, the, the impact of treatments going on for years and years and then living scan to scan, I cut those and it's really hard to be in the present moment that, that requires a lot of um, again, faith, that you're going to handle it well, non-attachment to the outcome, like I'm going to be okay no matter what. And it requires a belief in self that, that we discussed simultaneous to knowing that you've been here before. So while those emotions that I listed are all temporary, just like every emotional experience, there's a beginning, a middle and an end to, to all the emotions. Getting through the middle is the hard part. Think of it like a wave. Okay, at the top of the wave where you crest is where you lose control. We don't have any control over whether or not we feel something. We have control over how much and how long we feel it with our thinking. So if you notice this and you're okay with losing control for a moment and going, oh, I've, I've been scared before, I can be scared again, uh, and, I, and the world's not going to spin off its axis, then the next time you feel that fear, even if it's a different amplitude of fear than the little, the little one you had before or as a child or whatever, um, your brain will know. I've been here before. This is just a bigger one. I will get through on the other side. And that'll help you from, you know, maybe riding the roller coaster of, of emotion throughout life. You go, I, I've been here before. I know this is okay. And you won't have to stuff it down, ignore it, bottle it up, pretend it doesn't exist, rationalize it away. Um, and you can live fully in the moment, experiencing all those emotions the way that they're supposed to be experienced. 
I'll also say with late term and long effects, that's very real, and especially depending on when you've had your diagnosis, right? How have these treatments affected my body over time? What should I be on the lookout for? Who will I call? What is that? How would that be? I have a couple of clients who had cancer as teenagers and um, wrestle with that today, right? Like when, when will this show up for me again? And I think the more, I always tell people, the more you educate yourself and the more you understand where your risk factors lie, the treatments that you've had, the amount of radiation that you've had, where is that gonna, what, where, what are the potential risk factors? Educate yourself, have that very open dialogue. Hopefully all of you, I think it's more and more a standard of care that you're walking out of your treatment with a survivorship long-term care plan. But that should include, because you, as a young survivor, your medical care is going to be handled by many different doctors along the way, right? You're, you're young, and so you're going to grow up, and you're going to leave your, this doctor, you're going to maybe move, you're going to do all these things. And so you have to take that sense of ownership of, hey, what happened to my body at this age? What treatments, what, what, what drugs went through my system? And bleomycin can have an effect on my lungs over time. Adromycin can have an effect on my heart over time. You know, so how do I pay attention to that? What do I'm looking for? And how do I continue to educate the doctors? Um, I think it's also something, you know, that we talk about going for follow-up scans, like, like it's just like, that, like stress or like coping. You know, it's a vague word, follow-up scan. But there's legitimacy and really talking through with your medical team about when I come for my follow-up. What are you looking for? What are you watching for? What are you looking for that could change? What are the things that would alarm you? So that you kind of understand what's the doctor getting out of this appointment and how will I kind of better understand and get that ground? The more information you have, often the more control you will feel. Um, oh, go ahead. That, that's another place where you know, as young adult survivors, that, that, that to feel isolated in this is so normal, right? I mean, do any of your other friends have cancer, right? Like it's very hard to talk about this with your peers. And, and there is a certain brand of support that you get from peers, right, that you need. And that might be part of this. And for parents out there that are listening, find your other parents of survivors. They might not be the people that you talk about your vacations with or whatever, but they're the people that you turn to when you're feeling that worry and that concern about, hey, my daughter's getting gearing up for a scan and, and I'm worried about this, or I don't know how this is gonna be. Um, so find your peer support. Um, that's, that's an important resource in a, it, for you as you walk through this journey. I want to be mindful of our time here, um, so I'm going to take. I'm going to try to take about uh, three to five minutes here just to explain and lay some groundwork for Daniela's question about the uh, the shame slash guilt slash fear. So, to put a put a perspective on this, there's a uh, another uh, famous guy in our field named Carl Jung. It's uh, J U N G, and um, his work is very very deep. Um, you need to pace yourself if you're going to read, read Jung's writings. But um, he's got this idea that we do something called projection. And what we do is we project something in us that we don't, we're not comfortable with and we throw it onto other people uh, in an attempt to try to make sense of the world or dance around things or just make ourselves comfortable. It satisfies what, what he would call an ego. And an ego is just simply a, a way of looking at the world. So um, when we project onto people what we think they need or what we think they're afraid of about us, what we're doing is we're creating a, an artificial barrier there to connectivity. So the first thing we would wanna do is like, I would wanna ask Danielle, like, what do you, what do you think they're thinking of you? Um, and then maybe just go up and ask them. <laughs> now that's, that's challenging and that, that takes a little bit of a, a leap. But um, simultaneous to this, I wanna, I wanna paint the, the background of the, the purpose of shame and guilt. We have these emotions and they're very important. The function of shame is to tell us that we fail to meet somebody else's expectations. A sadness is when we don't get our own expectations met. So shame is when we cause sadness in someone else. Now that can happen a number of ways. Uh, one of my favorite examples is if we get up and walk out of here, if we were in a room and not a virtual room, and I step on Julie's uh, shoe and uh, give her a flat tire, she turns around and goes, hey, um, I should feel something like shame because I failed to meet her expectation. Now, the interesting thing is she's got this expectation that she didn't know she had until it wasn't met, which is her shoes should stay on her foot and I, sh I shouldn't step on it. Um, but when that happens, she goes, hey, Jake. And I look at it, oh my gosh, that triggers guilt. Guilt says, go make, a right, go make it right. R meaning um, make a correction for the thing that you screwed up. So I would say, I'm so sorry. And maybe help her get it back on or something. And then hopefully she extends some forgiveness and life moves on. Now, 
What's really dangerous about this shame guilt relationship is a lot of us have been raised in environments where we're on a shame guilt treadmill where you, you fail and then uh, you try to make amends and then the person you failed doesn't let you. So maybe uh, going back to our example of Julie, she goes, you know what? My ankle really hurts. Uh, buy me a Coke and we'll call it good. Okay. So I buy her a Coke and we, we uh, sip the, the, the refreshing goodness of a Coca-Cola. And, uh, and then at the end of that, she burps and says, you know what? Uh, my ankle still really hurts and so does my heel. Uh, how about some pizza? Well, now I'm suddenly chasing Julie to hopefully win her forgiveness. And at some point I have to evaluate whether or not this relationship is worthwhile. This has important evolutionary uh, and societal impact. Let me go back like 40,000 years to when we were all cavemen and ladies. There's an anthropological theory that I mentioned earlier that the reason we all survived and some of the other hominids didn't is because we hung together in tribes. Um, the way that we do that is through our emotional functioning. Shame has a very important purpose in our life to say that you, you fail to meet somebody's expectations. And uh, the reason that it's important to go make atonement for that through our guilt feeling is so that we don't get kicked out of the tribe. If, if it's my job to go hunt down meat for dinner and I say, I'm going to go get a gazelle, I'll be back later, fellas. And then several hours go by and I return empty handed and the sun is setting. The tribe's going to look at me and go, hey, Jake, we need to eat. Hopefully that shame triggers guilt and I go, all right, I'll go find a rabbit or something. Um, because if I get kicked out of the tribe, I will die. I need the tribe to survive. So we don't want to eliminate shame and guilt, but we don't want irrational shame and guilt either. So it's important to notice where these shame and guilt feelings come from. My invitation would be to look at that, that shame and go, well, who did you let down? Where is the mistake that you made? And if there is such a thing, can you make atonement? Is there a path to reconciliation? A lot of times people don't, don't do that. We, you know, big religion tends to do that too. It's like, you know, you're, you're a sinner and you'll always be a sinner, uh, but keep trying. And it's like the target keeps moving and, and, and it's very frustrating. So we want to, we want to acknowledge that while we feel these feelings, sometimes they come from a place that's way, way buried in our past that no longer bears relevance. Uh, maybe the people that we think are, are disappointed is, are no longer disappointed and we're carrying that baggage ourselves. Sometimes uh, they are beating us over the head and they're saying, you know, if you love me, you would. And you're like, whoa, whoa wait a minute. That's, that's not the terms of our, re our agreement. So um, if you look at like what you're expecting people to think of you, that, that projective thing, and you weigh it against what the shame and guilt feelings are actually telling you, you can center yourself and go, you know what? I don't have to feel this anymore. That was a feeling from yesteryear or, you know what? Maybe this is all imagined. Maybe my best friend doesn't actually hate me or maybe I could go ask him <laughs> and, uh, and really find that out and, and settle it down. So that's how I encourage people to overcome these, these thoughts and the feelings is, is, is check and see if they're actually real. And, and if they are, see if there's a path to, to atonement or, or, you know, making things right. Um, and then take it step by step if there is or isn't. It's almost like a flow chart. Um, and hopefully you, you gain control. And I, I threw in the, the five basic human needs as a, as a little bit of a template there. If you, you know, Julie was talking about what need is being met. And you're like, well, I don't know what my needs are. There's five that a guy named Carol, uh, sorry, um, William Glasser uh, came up with. And Glasser did a lot of writing on a lot of things. So you can look up his books too. That's just a video I did on the five basic needs. I'm going to take Daniela's question too. That's all great. And I love hearing how you kind of are dead. Um, deconstructing shame and guilt. I'm going to take this kind of just purely from a cancer survivor lens and this piece, because what I hear you saying, Daniela, is that you're feeling this sense of like, as a survivor, I don't know how people are going to perceive that piece of my identity. And maybe if, and I don't want to read into your words, I invite you to totally correct me if I'm getting this wrong. But also maybe I don't know how much I want to disclose and in disclosing what would happen. Um, and first of all, if that is hitting it at all for you, um, you are so not alone. You have no idea how many people walk into my office and say, okay, I think I'm figuring this out for myself, but I don't know how to talk about this. And I'm certainly not going to talk about it on a first date or a date. I don't even know when I'm going to tell people if I begin dating them. And if I go back to work and people, people that I meet that I've never met before, like I'm going to college or I'm going to places, I'm going to meet people that I've never met before. They don't even know this piece about me. It is a huge part of who I am that I've been a cancer survivor. But do I talk about it? It seems like a pretty big, heavy conversation to have, like when you're first meeting somebody over pizza and beer. Or like, when, where, where do I put this? And I would say that 
this is a journey of understanding and identity. And it takes time to kind of figure out how has cancer changed me? Like I said, initially, and, and what have I learned? And I say that very cautiously because I, I recognize that you could have learned many of these lessons without a cancer diagnosis. I get it. But what has cancer shown you about yourself? And what about those lessons do you maybe want to share and want to be a part of? You know, cancer has taught me that I'm far more resilient than I ever realized. Cancer has helped me realize that I can do hard things, that I am that I can find my way through dark moments, that, you know, that I faced fear and I've, you know, gone through some pretty heavy, I've learned this stuff about myself. I want to do it again, but I've learned this about me. And, and so it's, it takes a while to figure to a figure that out, but also figure out how to articulate that. And um, so I don't know if you're overcoming it or if you're diving into it. Are you know, kind of like working to understand it and, and more over time. Um, I don't know if that, and I think, you know, there's, there can be, uh, this was another question that we had kind of created, but I did a whole keynote presentation once for young adults on this pressure to do something with this diagnosis, this real intense feeling of like, oh my gosh, I've survived. And now I've got to be like a super survivor. I've got to go start an organization, run every single 5k, wear pink ribbons all my whole life. Um, I've got to be totally happy and wellness and, um, you know, bright side um, and smell every rose. And um, I've had people say to me, yeah, that's sometimes how I feel. But other times I'm really scared and I'm really feeling uncertainty and fear and frustration and I get I I I'm worried that I'm going to get back into my daily grind and forget the perspective that I gained. I think you got to just double down on self-compassion. And that you're human and that we get to do this and we get to restart every day and that you can set your intentions and you can look deeply inside of yourselves about what you hope most for yourself and what you when you look back what you're proud of and what you feel good about and really anchor yourself in that and give yourself that every day. Uh, Julie and Jake, I had a quick thing. I wanted to kind of go back to something you guys mentioned in the beginning uh, about mind and body. Um, I'm, I, everybody deals with emotions and stress in different ways. And uh, you know, I'm kind of one of the guys that just kind of pushes it down and that kind of stuff. And I, I'm fine with it, dealing with it that way. That works for me, but I have a family member um, whose emotional stress and um, everything really affects her and manifests in a physiological way where she uh, has high blood pressure uh, instances, not like uh, <clears throat> reoccurring, but just a, a quick instance, uh, shaking uncontrollably, different things like that. Is there a way to help? I mean, obviously, aside from, you know, some grief counseling or some different things like that, is there a way to help um, somebody that's experiencing these uh, emotional uh, feelings manifesting into a physiological issue so that they don't have health issues down the road um, from yeah. this. Yeah, absolutely there is. Um, I think the first step is a very gentle um, attempt to acknowledge what's going on. So if, if, the, if this person doesn't, isn't, isn't aware of what's going on, you're seeing it from the outside, trying to help bring that awareness, say, hey, I think, I think this this thing's going on and this is why um, is the first step. Now, I, I know people who are well into their seventies who uh, I can't, I can't broach that conversation with them because it, they would, they would shut down because uh, it would be, it would be opening up floodgates of years and years and years of suppression or <laughs> repression. Um, that would be the first step. And so I'll pause there and see, is that, is that possible? Does, does she know that that's the connection? Yeah, she's well aware of the connection. Uh, I think it's just a matter for her of uh, uh, it's my it's my mom that I'm talking about, by the way, yeah. it's just a matter for her of not being able to deal with um, the issue, I guess, like you were talking about earlier, it may be a rational way. It's, it's all these emotions overwhelm yeah. her and, and just kind of flood over her and then her body then takes over and manifest it yeah. manifest it physiologically where she shakes and her blood pressure, you know, rises extremely high and though she can't control it. Yeah. She can't get out of her own head to, to control it in a way that would 
make rational sense, like you said earlier. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, um, I want to check with the the group. I, I'm just going to keep going. Uh, you guys feel free to to dip out if you need to. I know we plan for 1:30, but um, I, I'm I, I'll keep rolling if you guys want to. I'm good till 1:55. I got an appointment at two, but um, all right, Danny's giving a thumbs up. So. I think for, for context, when people get to that stage of their lives where they practiced, and I'm just going to call it that, they practiced emotional avoidance for a very long time. Um, think back to the wave, right? You got a beginning, a middle, and an end to this emotional experience. Well, as we start off as children, um, the emotional experiences are, are very small because there's not much there's not much hanging in the balance as a child. You're well protected for the most part, and you're, you're given a, a good environment. As we grow in, uh, in uh, adolescence, and then into adulthood, life's uh, stakes, if you will, seem to get taller. And so the, the emotional wave gets amplified bigger, bigger, bigger. Um, if you don't tolerate the low ones, and you just bail out, it, it makes the big ones seem impossible. So when we invite people to, to feel even a little bit of something to come into the present and validate what they're feeling, emotionally, it seems to that person like it's bottomless. And that if they go down this path, they'll never recover. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. Um, but if you've, if you've only practiced tolerating this much emotion and then bailing out, you don't have the, the historical understanding that it is possible to tolerate it. So clinically, what we would do is we would try to um, help them feel a little bit of something. And, and I purposely push people into emotion so that they can feel it. And then I go, see, you felt something and, and the world didn't end. Um, and th that might be something like, I th I'm a big fan of throwing markers at people because uh, that surprise is one of the, the most benign emotions we can have. I, I had to be a little bit careful when I worked inpatient with adults or with uh, children and adolescents because the children and adolescents in inpatient facilities are, are very, very edgy. And so uh, some of them come from, most of them come from trauma households. So if I throw a marker at the wrong person, I could really, really screw them up. Um, but, but I like throwing markers at people. I could go, see, you, you felt something, the marker fell to the floor, you're safe. There's an emotion, uh, little tiny ones. That's what we do clinically. Personally, though, um, what you can do is start taking guesses based on those 10 because they're more precise. And you go, it sounds like you're just really feeling sad. It sounds like you're really feeling quite scared. And, and if you're wrong, people will correct you. you know, I'm not scared. I'm, I'm angry. Okay. All right. Well, what do you talk, talk to me about what anger is, you know, and then, and then over the course of that, those conversations, maybe you go, you know, what? it might be time for you to talk to a therapist. And, and say it just like I said it there, like, like, man, your car's really rattling. It might be time to take it into the mechanic shop. We're not uncomfortable with that conversation, but for some reason, like, you know, popping the hood and checking the belts and hoses on the, on the psyche is like taboo. Um, so if you can, if you can ease your way in by a little bit of validation, a little bit of education, tell her to listen to my podcast, you know, I mean, no, no harm done there. Uh, and then, uh, and then maybe there's, there's a little bit of, of leeway there to go, you know what, you've been dealing with this a really long time, go see a professional, man, you got health insurance, you know, and then it's it, make it just as offhanded and casual as possible. And you, you might get a real, a reasonable reception to that. I love that piece about trying to kind of understand, I think sometimes when we're relationships coming from a place of curiosity can be so nice, right? Like, you know, I'm really wondering if you're I'm wondering if you're feeling really scared. I'm wondering if you're feeling this. Like a lot gives them space to correct you and to kind of change that up for you. But if this is a close relationship, this is your mom. Um, I don't mean this to sound manipulative, but also you can borrow on, she loves you and you love her. And saying, hey mom, I'm worried about you. Or I am feeling concern and worry about you. And I want you to feel better. I want you to feel calmer. And, and would she do it initially for you? And again, I say that not as a way of manipulating her, but saying, you know, it would be calming for me to know that you were cared for, for me to know that you were gaining, you know, these skills of, of feeling better and feeling more grounded. And is there any way that I can, what would it, what could I do that could help you to kind of get the support that you need today? Cause it can't always be you, right? I don't always know what to say and I want you to feel supported. So that could kind of lead you there. I think a lot of what pe what Julie's talking about um, afflicts a lot of people in today's culture where we're so afraid to offend. And one of those offenses might be, you know, leveraging someone's uh, shame. Uh, that's literally why our emotions exist. We should not be afraid to engage in those emotions for a benevolent purpose. Um, we're not, 
we're not leveraging them to, for personal gain or to get them to, you know, get her to alter her will or, you know, like we, we, we truly, it's coming from a place of love. And that's what I, I'm sure Julie can attest to this too. Cause I, I'm starting to get the idea that we went to the same school. Cause you say like, what's in my head. Um, we, um, we establish credibility and rapport with our clients by being honest and transparent and coming from a place of love and compassion. And that allows us to say bold things later. Uh, and really challenge people, hold limits, you know, put our foots in their, in their butts metaphorically, because they know we're not doing it to be mean. It's not self gratifying. It's not out of a place of, you know, sociopathy. <laughs> we, we really care. And so you can come to somebody and go, dude, what do you mean you're still smoking? We've been working on this for weeks. And then they go, Oh, I let you down too. You go, that's okay. I, I love you still. Let's, let's move forward. Um, but if we're so afraid of offense that we can't have a, re, a, a, a good conversation, a, a hard conversation, then nothing's going to happen anyway. So yeah, care, hold that space for her. Um, know that you have a, a very strong relationship uh, from which you can express that concern. And it may trigger that very appropriate shame and guilt that goes, oh man, I don't want to scare my kid. All right, I'll go get this taken care of. It's totally um, appropriate. And, and I'll just say one other thing that's kind of a little different and um, and this applies to all of you in different ways. I, I think of psychological coping, like um, the work that I do in my office or the work that each of you hopefully are doing on your own to self-care is having a dynamic interplay between soothing and calming and introspection and insight and growth, right? So when you're activated, and then the, 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 if that's maybe showing up emotionally, like pissed off anger or heartbeat going and blood pressure spiking, to your point um, about that, whether it's a physical manifestation of feeling activated or an emotional one or your thoughts, step one is calming. Like we got to get calm. We got to get grounded. We got to get calm. That not only is going to help you feel better, but it's also going to help you act smarter. So, and I think that sometimes when we are particularly stressed or when we are really struggling, that might be the only goal. Because sometimes to try and get insight driven and why is this coming out? Where is this coming from? What happened in my childhood? And where, where, how was I triggered? And what was said? And how did that go? To sometimes get too deep into that can kind of fuel the emotion. It kind of re-kicks it, right? So sometimes we need to let go of the reins, not figure it out, not analyze, let it go and just focus on calming. Just focus on getting centered, getting your body calm, getting your blood pressure, getting your heart rate set, set, quieter, getting a little bit, to turn the volume down. And then when the volume's down, then we can go back and say, whoa, what just happened there? How, how did we get there? So I think if you can think of that too, is that coping is this interplay of getting calm, getting quiet, and also understanding what just happened and how, how do I kind of prevent or help myself in the future. I want to touch on something that may be helpful because I saw a couple moms in the chat there. Um, what I've experienced through um, can cancer diagnoses as well as other chronic ailments where um, parents are caring for children or children are caring for parents in, in perpetuity or for long stretches is a, um, sort of a, a guilt that, that befalls the recipient of the care. Um, saying, you know, I, I, I feel bad that I, you know, cost my mom and dad all this money, or uh, I, f I feel horrible because my kids shouldn't have to be taking care of their parents. So, you know, that kind of thing. And, and that's, and that's fine. We want to validate that and acknowledge it. Um, but regardless of what side of that you're on, whether you're the one feeling bad, or you're the one who's the recipient of the, the, the shame being projected onto you, um, What's important is to, to know and understand the idea of gift giving um, is given freely and to help paint the picture for your, uh, the gift recipients, it, it's a little bit analogous to, to give somebody something at Christmas time and then have them say, I don't want to take this from you because um, I know it cost you X amount of dollars. It's like, that would be very rude, right? To, re to reject a gift. Um, and I just want to speak to that and acknowledge that we're, we don't want to gloss over that. Um, similarly, flip side of that coin is there can be resentment, 
right? There can be resentment that this disease uh, costs so many resources over time. And again, I'd go back to uh, faith and understanding and, and belief in oneself and the idea that resources and provision tend to tend to come and go, you know, anyway. Uh, this just happened to be one uh, avenue through which they flowed. And if you got a history that says, you know what, I've, I've always kind of sort of been here, maybe through thin and flush, not always flush, more thin. Um, I'll always continue being here. Same as the emotional functioning. I've been here before. Um, I'll continue being here. We're just going to keep working hard, et cetera, et cetera. That alleviates a lot of the resentment if you're not so attached to the to the um, the time, the resources, the money. Um, and then if you're the the shame experiencer, um, learning to receive grace and accept gifts uh, is is really important, so that you're not also offending the person who's doing the gift giving. And it's like, well, of course they take care of me. They're my parents. It's like, well, no, not everybody's parents do that. Um, <laughs> we do choose where we spend our money. Um, so I just wanted to address that. And if anybody had any questions, we can, you know, deal with them specifically. Somebody mentioned survivor guilt and I, um, that's a, an all too mm. looked over topic. We don't talk about survivor guilt enough actually in the world. <laughs> it's real. Yeah. Um, but there's also caregiver guilt, right? You know, I've, I've sat with people who feel like they're aware that they've got to take care of themselves. They know but it is so hard to turn away. It is so hard to, to walk away from the person that you love and, um, and take a break and take a moment when they're in need of you and to just tend to yourself. And I had a client once say to me, I needed to be able to walk away from the bedside. And I don't know if anybody, any of you are in active treatment, but this caregiving can happen even as a parent, we're constantly caregiving, right? That you're constantly on call. But how in those moments we can just remember, I have to take care of myself and shamelessly and relentlessly forgive yourself for needing to do that. Um, I also want to say, and I likely as parents know this, but it bears repeating that it is quite common. It is very common for parents of um, cancer survivors, adolescent children and adolescent to experience PTSD and to sit by your child through these intense moments and um, witness all that they've gone through and they're your baby, <laughs> and to feel after this experience um, PTSD. And so I just want to name that because if there are moments anticipating a scan or whatever where you feel particularly anxious, that's a trigger. And your work in that, the way we address PTSD, is really peeling apart the, um, the, the, the experience that you're in right now, getting ready for a scan, and the time when you were going through treatment as very different. This is a different moment. This is a different place. You are safe now. This is different. This is a different experience. So, so just, just naming that for you, because sometimes in naming something that you're experiencing, it also can take some air out of it a little bit and help you to feel like, oh yeah, that's why this feels as intense as it does. Sometimes I've, I've encountered people where the, the very letters PTSD trigger a, a defense response simply because of the occupation that they, they work, where it's like, I can't, I can't be diagnosed with PTSD, I'll lose my job or I'll lose whatever. Um, I, I happen to work in the firearms world, trying to bridge the gap between mental health and firearms. PTSD is one of those things that gets floated out as like a, a weapon to, to what, you know, threaten people with and say, oh, don't, don't you dare go to the counselor, you former Marine, because they're going to diagnose you with PTSD and you're going to lose your gun rights. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Unfortunately, that there's this narrative out there that says that's, you know, that your medical files are accessible to everybody at all times and your, your job's going to fire you or find you incompetent to, you know, perform or whatever. And that's not true. They don't get to paw through your files unless you authorize them to. And that's a different conversation to be had. But um, the simple fact is that we, we still have to bill insurance to get reimbursed by and large, unless you want to pay cash out of pocket and insurance in our field requires a diagnosis. Uh, we are, to my knowledge and understanding, the only branch of the medical profession that doesn't do well care checks throughout the year. Uh, dentistry does it, optometry does it, pediatrics does it, everybody does it but us. And that's a problem with the insurance system where we can't do just a maintenance check two or three times a year. So unfortunately, you do have to have a diagnosis and that diagnosis does go somewhere. Um, and if you're really concerned about your occupation, um, that's a conversation to be had with your, your local provider about, hey, who's going to see this file and what's, what's it mean? 
but we have to get an accurate diagnosis of you in order to, to form an accurate treatment plan because that's, that's the only way to get to recovery. I can't diagnose somebody with depression when they actually have post-traumatic stress disorder because the, the treatment would be very different and it would just be, it'd be disingenuous and it would possibly cause even more harm if we're, you know, we're hitting the wrong, the wrong target. So just know that going forward, if somebody's triggered by like PTSD, I can't, I, I can't have PTSD. It's like, no, actually you do hit all the criteria and this is how we recover from it. Not this other way uh, that's being, you know, slightly uh, disingenuous and sk skirting, skirting fact, simply to avoid some bad optics. It's, that's part of the stigma of our profession. And I'm fighting it on a daily basis, loudly and publicly as often as I can. But until we get there, uh, it's, it's a thing. And I wanted to call that elephant in the room too. You know, I think that right now we are in this beautiful period where mental health is getting a lot of attention. Yeah, right? for sure. And well-being mm -hmm. is. And I like to say that your mental health is not simply the absence of mental illness. Yep. It's not the absence of anxiety and depression. It is both the absence of that and the presence of resilience and coping and, and these skills of self-care. So going to therapy for me, and of course I'm biased because I'm a therapist, but going to therapy for me is going to the mental gym. You know, like we're going to go to the mental gym and we're going to talk about, you know, what is it like to get used to tolerating this feeling so that it can live in the background while you focus on what's in front of you so that you get better able to do that. So that in my, I'm trained as a social worker. I'm a private practitioner right now. I've had private practice for over 15 years, but my training is social work. And sometimes people ask me, um, you know, how do I find a therapist or how do you do this? There are many ways to find a therapist. You can certainly talk to your primary care physician. You can get referrals to medical providers that you already have. You can look at your insurance board. You can do all of those things. You can look at Psychology Today Therapist Finder with a zip code. You can ask a friend, you can do all of these things. But really what you want to look for is a fit. It's a relationship. When I am sitting in my office with people, we are in a relationship. And I, they mostly want to feel understood. And am I getting them? Am I hearing you? Am I getting you? Am I understanding what you're trying to lay out there for me? And so if you go forward with finding this relationship in your life, what are you looking for? What would you find in that? Um, Social, Jake, I don't know what your training was, but social work training is different than, you know, PA, than, a, than a psychologist or psychiatrist. Psychiatrist is medical, psychologist is medical school, but a different branch. Social work is we're trained in a strength-based perspective. So yes, I have to do all that diagnostic criteria and I will, but my lens through which all of my education came was what is working within you? What is, what is functioning? And we're going to grab that. I'm going to put up a mirror and shine it back on you. We're going to strengthen that. And we're going to help you fine tune what else. Because you're, I say to people all the time, you're sitting in front of me. <laughs> something got you there. How'd you get there? You know, so some things at work. Let's figure out what that is and kind of keep, keep crafting around that. Yeah. Um, and, it, and don't, don't be too scared if it doesn't click right away. Give the, give the clinician a shot and tell them, you know, tell them what's not working. Uh, so they have a chance Always. to meet you where you are. Um, we, we like hearing that kind of stuff. Mental yeah. health and physical therapy. I think we're getting close into our time. So I want to just kind of say that if there's anything else that you guys really want to like throw out in the chat, please do so. Um, I would, I would second what Jake said about if you're in therapy and something's not working, tell them your therapist mm -hmm. shouldn't be offended by that. It's a relationship, right? So I have people tell me all the time, like, I don't get this. <laughs> I'm like, well, good. Let's talk more about that. What does that mean to you? Yeah. So. Jake and Julie, this is fantastic information. Thank you so much again for your time. I know we have a, only a couple minutes left here, but is there anything that, um, I mean, for our, our participants here today, what would be the best way to, for them to maybe reach out to you if they have any other questions or something along those lines? I'll go ahead and put my website in the chat. You guys can have my website. You can learn more about me there and reach out if you need me. It's fine. Yeah, I'll do the same. Um, right now, unfortunately, I'm not taking new clients on myself. Um, but if you wanted to, um, let me type this in here. Can't do, can't talk and chew gum at the same time. Um, uh, I have... 16, 17 other clinicians, most of whom I personally trained who are all very, whoops, that went to Danny privately. That's my bad. Sorry, Danny. Apparently I don't know how to use Zoom, even though I use it nine hours a day. Um, 
they're they're all super competent. Um, if you're living in the Reno area, Zephyr Wellness uh, takes most major insurances, all the Medicaid's, and um, we also have graduate students who can see people regardless of insurance or ability to pay. Uh, and that's a really nice gift that we've done uh, to for the community and for ourselves too, because we we selfishly like to create a little farm farm team of uh, <laughs> clinicians in our pipeline, so that we don't have to go throwing up uh, Craigslist ads to to re recruit. Uh, talent, but uh, we won't turn you away uh, regardless of your coverage. And um, they're all very, very high quality. Um, if you want to email me, it's just jake at zephyrwellness.org. Uh, remind me where you, you met me um, and say, hey, I, I wanted to follow up with, you know, something or whatever. I'm, I'm open to that. Everybody, everybody has my email anyway, so I, I don't mind throwing it out there. Um, I'm good with that. Cool. Well, thank you so much, you guys. Uh, that This was absolutely incredible. And I know it was kind of a short turnaround time to get this up and running and super, very grateful for your guys' time and, um, you know, sharing your perspectives um, on the mental health of, from, from the cancer journey. I, I think there's I mean, definitely packed a lot of powerful information in here. And uh, as we t talked about one of our previous sessions, we could go a, a you know, a half day to a full day on topics such as like this and have its own exclusive conference. But uh, uh, I want to thank you guys again for, you know, carving out your time. And, um, you know, if, if that day comes where we do have a, a Survivor Summit dedicated to the topic of mental health and wellness, um, I'd love to just reach out to you. And if, you, if you're available to participate, great. Um, you know, I just want to throw that out there. I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, I, I say this frequently on any format that I get to speak. I say this, this stuff doesn't do any good locked up in my head, so we, we might as well share it. Uh, I just want to live in a healthy society. I don't, I don't care who, who gets paid or who gets credit. Uh, there's enough hurt out there to go around for everybody. So there's no reason to fight over it or be territorial. So might as well just like give this stuff away. The more of these we, I can do, um, the happier I get and um, the, the more healthy we all become. To Jake's point, you know, mental health and your journey on this could be with a therapist, but my goodness, right now, you, you got podcasts galore, right? Like you got Jake's very important but you've got tons there's so much out there right now embrace it grab it and, and listen to it read it let yourself kind of get lost in this self journey of figuring learning who you are that's a real gift yeah thanks danny love it thanks you guys and then before we wrap up here um you know we're still working on a post-event survey we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants here and um, if you, like I said, if you attended at least two sessions and you fill out the survey, if you are a scholarship candidate, you will be eligible for two, one of two $250 scholarships in addition to what we're um, awarding this spring. So just make sure you fill out the survey when you get it in the email, hopefully by tomorrow morning at the latest. Uh, I got a client. I'm out. And I want to... I want to thank everybody for your for your help for participating here in the command center. We got Pete crying and and Jen Walsh in the room right now. Uh, Garrett has been instrumental in helping us get some of the data for my presentation and just helping us out overall as a, as a survivor and a recipient as a, as a board member. Um, I think I saw Andrea on here at some point and she, she popped out. Marshall O'Malley, uh, grateful for your friendship. You know, we go back uh, a couple of years for the, to the PSN days and glad we can connect here and, and work together in this capacity. Um, see, Bill's not here. He did our cover slide. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, Haley Litoff. She is, uh, she is the uh, prime job candidate for uh, uh, any PR firm. I don't know if she's still on the call or not, but uh, she, just, she did two of our marketing videos and she's just done a wonderful job. So she's out in the job market as well. So um, again, thank you so much for your time. And um, unless you have any questions, I think we call it a wrap. Cool. Great day. Awesome job, you guys.